Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of Giant Health's Healthy Innovators Live TV. Every week, we bring you a collection of incredibly interesting and capable and successful dynamic people that are in the leading edge of developing new innovations in healthcare and technology in order to make the world a better place. My name is Barry Schreier, and I'd like to thank the many thousands of viewers from around the world. This week's episode brings four incredibly interesting people, and I'm very proud to introduce them to you. Before we do that, though, I just want to thank our sponsors. These weekly episodes of Healthy Innovators Live TV are brought to you by Giant Health. Please go to the website, www.gianthealth, and look at what's coming up in the Giant Health agenda. According to the Financial Times, Giant Health is Europe's largest, most valuable annual gathering of healthcare technology innovators. And there's an exciting new program coming up in May from the 17th to 20th of May. This is European Health Tech Innovation Live conferences taking place in Berlin, Barcelona, Paris, Stockholm, and Liverpool to bring together the leading innovators from across Europe, along with investors, clinicians, the largest hospital groups, government healthcare leaders, and the entire community of healthcare technology innovators. We hope you can join us there. I'd also like to thank Vodafone Business and Barclays Bank Eagle Labs for their generous sponsorship. We love you guys and glad that you're supporting us. So to begin with, we're just gonna be talking to the team today who have come together to talk about some of the biggest challenges in healthcare. So hello, Shane, how are you? Hi, very well, thank you, Barry. Been looking forward to this. Excellent, thank you, and glad to have you on board. So Shane, what are some examples? What's a great big challenge in society or in healthcare that we need to address? And what are things that you guys are doing in that area? So I think uh, the, the single biggest thing is interoperating, integrating, whatever you wanna call it, it's bringing data together Yes. benefit of citizens. And yeah. for me, that's from conception of life to beginning life and through every aspect of it. And primarily it's around health and social care. And I think, and I know from some of my colleagues, Victoria and Rachel here today, that we've all worked on challenges to try and we're passionate about bringing, uh, bringing, making things happen. And the single biggest challenge I think we've got is belief. And then so many times I hear people say, we're decades away from this. For sure, we've been working on it for decades, but every piece of technology and every capability actually exists today. And I think yes. the single biggest challenge is people, and it's getting people to be open-minded, to believe, and to try stuff. And we need to get it to be good enough, not excellent to start with. And I think that's the single biggest challenge to enable any kind of technology uh, and any kind of, the, the, the mission for me is about personalized precision medicine, and yep. about distribution of the best possible healthcare to every individual on the planet. Brilliant, excellent. Thank you, Shane, very, very interesting. I've never heard of this phrase, interoperability before. Maybe we can talk about that further. <laughs> no, sorry for being cheeky, but I'm glad you brought it up and it is important. And so um, I'm glad that we have the chance to look at that. So Rachel, hello, are you part of the Shane Fan Club? And uh, would you subscribe to the interoperability challenge? Well, I, I certainly subscribe to the interop bit. Um, uh, so, in in way of uh, in way of the Shane fan club, avid fan. Yeah. Uh, but the uh, the interop bit for me is um, is absolutely key. And I think uh, the last twelve months, um, you know, we've we've built more and more point solutions trying yes. to respond to COVID nineteen, uh, and. Yeah. You know, for anybody who's worked in healthcare, we recognise that there was a challenge around interoperability uh, over the last decade. Yes. And I, I think the, you know, the response, albeit necessary, to the pandemic has meant that we've built layer upon layer on top of that. So I think there's a real need to uh, you know, get a handbrake on and, and have a look at how do we address this, uh, this fundamental problem. Yes, yeah, it's interesting. Well, thank you for that contribution. And I'm very keen to drill down into more detail in that later on in the conversation. And um, hello, Victoria, so nice to see you. Thanks for joining us today. Hello. <laughs> um, so, well, I'm not gonna do interoperability because that is a massive challenge that has already been identified by um, Shane and Rachel. I guess one of the things that's on my mind, other than um, COVID, of course, and the impact of COVID, yes. is um, NHS reorganisation. Mm. I worked in the NHS. I've worked in and around the NHS for uh, 30 odd years. And my goodness, it likes to reorganise itself. And we're just about to start that journey all over again. And we've always got this tension between local and, and national, and we're bouncing um, between the two. I think the um, organisation into integrated care systems into a regional footprint 
has some um, promise to it. And at Mindwave, where I work, um, we've created a digital front door that enables um, patient citizens to access services via a digital um, nice. route. So I think those sorts of things are promising and interesting. Yes. But related to that, I'm going to throw one last thing in, and I think this has become really apparent through COVID is inequality, digital exclusion, digital poverty and inequality. And when we're thinking about these redesigning our services with a digital footprint at a regional level, we really have to be taking those issues very seriously indeed. Yes, absolutely. Uh, fundamental issues, which are at the very heart mm -hmm. of healthcare and the necessary indeed. quality that healthcare should be delivering and providing. So um, mm -hmm. thanks, Victoria. Thanks for raising that subject. And I'd also really love to discuss that in further detail as we go along today. So thank you. And um, hello, Jeremy, how are you? Hey, Barry, doing very well, thanks. And uh, hi to all the panellists as well. Pleasure to be here with you all. <laughs> so, um, to talk about the... the hey, thanks for joining us. So we're talking about the challenges. Oh, sorry, Barry. I'm sorry, go ahead, Jeremy. Pardon me for talking. No worries, no worries at all. So, for me, the main issue in, in healthcare, but in general, in, in industries that have the potential to use XR technology, is that there is a lack of education around what it can do. That is understanding what its potential is, that is understanding it at more than a theoretical level. And it's especially important for XR because it's such a, a visceral, visual, experiential technology. It's very different from, let's say, artificial intelligence or blockchain that you can at least try to explain on paper yes. and get to an understanding. Whereas XR, you really have to, to experience it firsthand to truly understand its potential. So we're doing a lot of work in that space to try and get headsets on people, on business leaders in healthcare and otherwise, and get them really understanding, or at least getting to 90% instead of 50%, the value of the technology. Yes. And, and even to a, to a mental health perspective, I think there is incredible potential to bring people together and collaborate in a way that we haven't been able to do so impactfully and so um, so brilliantly, you know, through tools like video conferencing. So I think there's a lot of untapped potential there. Absolutely. Yeah, no, Jeremy, agree completely. Um, just for the sake of our audience who might not have any particular technical background or who might not be as immersed in this as we are, could you clarify what you mentioned in terms of uh, XR and uh, any other acronyms like that, please? Absolutely. My apologies. <laughs> I tend to throw acronyms out there left, right and center. We but what them. I mean by XR is it's just an umbrella term for both virtual reality, which is all about immersing you in a completely different world, right? And augmented reality, which is about displaying digital information, elements, media on top of that real world of yours to give you insight on a certain procedure or a certain task. Okay, no, that's helpful. Thank you very much. I'm very keen to hear more about that later on in the discussion. So we've talked about some of the big challenges that we have in healthcare. Now, um, what are we doing about it? How are we addressing this? So uh, Shane, I don't disagree with you that interoperability uh, is uh, perhaps uh, an issue uh, in, in healthcare. Um, we hear that word every day of the week and it's a huge challenge. So you mentioned that in fact, it boils down to people and uh, willpower perhaps, if I understood you correctly. So what can we do, everybody on this conversation right now and uh, all of our listeners, what can we do to make a contribution there? What needs to be accomplished this year? So I think there's a huge opportunity, especially the, the advent of COVID has brought uh, mm. uh, to the fore, not just, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, has brought the use of technology in a much greater effect, um, but the need for the information to be around the person and their circumstances. So um, that's great that a lot of things have been adopted. For me, it's about how do we connect that up? And let me just clarify why we want to do that, because interoperability in itself isn't the answer. And, and it's not the answer that we're trying to crack. What we're trying to do is deliver real time care for a, for a person that's direct care. And if we do that, the byproduct is that that information can then be used for real time population health management. And if we do that, the byproduct is that we get real world, real time data for research. So for instance, at the beginning of COVID, I was reaching out to a number of people. I was pushed in some directions there's a lot of effort going into research data, and rightly yeah. so. So sure. actually, if we are getting the grips with COVID now, can we take some of the impetus and, and some of the momentum 
to actually open up our minds. I think one of the big things we saw about people was they dropped some of the barriers and the reasons for not working together, whether that's companies, whether that's institutions, different parts of the NHS. Mm. And the, the call I would make to people on here is to help spread the word about being open-minded. Now, my answer and the work that Temple Black and I set the company up just over a year or so ago to try and address this issue. How do we really bring things together? And Temple Black will do some of that, but actually we're also just trying to carve out how it can be done in different parts of the world and it be done on a global, uh, a global footprint and it can be replicated in different business models. But mm -hmm. I think what I'm trying to do, and it, I, know, I know from having uh, worked and spoken with Rachel and seen some of the work she's written about recently, she'll talk about technical debt. I know from working with Victoria where we're both vice chairs at the Tech UK Health and Social Care Council, We've just been part of a, a, a paper that was published last week, a 10-point plan to accelerate data in digital health and care. In fact, I think I've been involved in three papers in three months, all around the same kind of topic. Yes. And it frustrates me after, you know, I've been in this business for 24 years directly in health tech and another five directly in, in healthcare. But, but it, there is a platform capability whereby we can absorb data and pass it back in a cleansed fashion that can support both technical debt and legacy systems yes. on a journey to modernization, and whether that's the adoption of AR and VR, uh, whether it's just the amalgamation of patient records. And that for me is the thing, I want people to start to open up and understand that's not next generation. It is here okay. and now. And final, my final point is, if we put the foundations in right, it could serve us probably for about 100 years. That's a long time. It is, and I, I, I'll pause there because People might don't, don't often think in technology more than one or three years, but I'll, no, no, I'll no, um, have a go. But, uh, but Shane, that's a very, very interesting point. And I had the incredible luck and privilege to meet Stuart Brand, uh, obviously a uh, early uh, internet pioneer and the author of the book, The Clock of the Long Now, which I very, very strongly recommend to everybody. And uh, uh, of course, his recommendation is that society needs to figure out how to take a 10,000 year perspective, let alone a thousand year, let alone a hundred year, but I um, certainly agree with you. And that's a very interesting challenge, which um, doesn't come up um, uh, on my radar every day as I'm racing through TikTok to find further entertainment. Um, <laughs> so really interesting chain. Um, Rachel, how does that overlap with what you guys are doing? And can you elaborate a little bit more on some of the interesting points that um, that uh, Shane has raised? We don't have a, a hundred years to talk about it, but um, love to hear your views. That's, that's fine, Barry. I can, I can talk pretty quickly. Um, so in, in, way of, uh, in way of my kind of, I guess it's a soapbox for me, interoperability. It's, mm. it's driven absolutely by tying together the IT, um, but it's driven by tying together the IT and the systems um, for the richness of the data. Uh, and exactly the same, um, in the same way that, that Shane has articulated. And I think at the minute what we've got with the NHS is, you know, we have the National Sick Service, we don't have the National Health Service. Exactly. And the reality is we treat people at that point. Um, and if we get this data and we yeah. start to use it to empower individuals to make better choices themselves, um, and we can, you know, we can use that data to create a view around population health, mm -hmm. it puts us in a much stronger position than we are right now. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the other bit that kind of really resonated with me um, when Victoria was talking is the, the, the bit that around the NHS reorganisation, there's, yeah. there's part of me that sees these two things as being interlinked. So if we weren't reorganising every five minutes, then, you know, we could make some proper headway on some of these um, topics that have been around and challenges that have been around for a long period of time. Sure. Um, and, and, you know, the technology is there. It is about change management. It's about appetite. But as we've all seen in the last 12 months, you know, there was real resistance to doing online consultations before COVID. Absolutely. And overnight, boom, everybody's up for it. Now, yes. it's not, the, you know, panacea for everything. Um, and I get that. But I, I think riding on the wave um, is a smart move. Um, but, but also, you know, we must make some semi firm decisions about the organisation of the NHS. The public view it as one organisation. It's only us that work mm -hmm. in it that know it's, you know, it definitely isn't one. But um, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm on my favourite subject here, Barry, so I'll pipe down for a minute and let somebody else come in. <laughs> yes, well, Victoria, please, if you could elaborate on that. Um, uh, if we are, of course, going to uh, send this video directly to um, Matt Hancock uh, and to uh, <laughs> Boris, Boris uh, the Prime Minister, um, what exactly should they be doing right now? Well, I'm going to come back to my little soapbox, which is around digital um, exclusion, actually, because um, uh, Rachel and Shane have talked a lot about data and interoperability, but we need to be make sure, making sure that we're capturing the right data from the right people and we're not leaving shadows where data isn't collected because people are excluded, because sure. increasingly data is not just coming from electronic patient records, it's coming from all sorts of um, different um, sources. Mm. and. Um, and to be digitally included is not just about having a device. I've been to so many digital health conferences where people stand up on the stage and go, smartphone use is ubiquitous, everyone uses technology, and, and they don't. Even people with a smartphone often don't know how to use all the functions and features yes. um, within it. To give you an example, in the very early days of the pandemic, is a great um, digital inclusion project called 100% Digital in Leeds. And the digital inclusion workers were lending tablets with data on to um, excluded people. They were literally standing in people's gardens, leaning in through the window to be socially distanced, helping someone to work out how to set up Zoom. So, you know, this is really, really basic stuff for a significant, um, a small but significant um, chunk of the um, population. Sure. So I think if I was speaking to Matt Hancock and Boris Johnson, I'd be saying we need to make this a national priority. It falls between lots of different departments. So we need a joined up approach, not just from the NHS, but with DCMS and other government departments. Yes. But then thinking about you've got that national priority but then you need that direction for the ICSs at a regional level to be really taking this seriously as well and making sure it's a priority for them. And I'm going to big up um, Habitat now, who are doing some great work around um, inclusive digital transformation at yeah. that regional footprint level. And what they advocate is very much a community development approach. Find out where your assets are, find out who's where the energy is, who's doing good stuff, Yes. And build up from there. So work with the work with and lean into your communities who are doing good stuff, promote, amplify, resource and support them to spread um, the work that they're doing. Yes. So I think you need a bit of top down, but you need a lot of energy and support from the bottom up as well. Uh, absolutely. And uh, thank you for bringing up those important subjects. Um, Jeremy, I'm just wondering out loud in terms of connections here um, with XR, with VR, uh, is, is that something which is, how do you say it, uh, quite an exclusive technology these days? Um, and is that something which has the potential to reach people from an inclusion perspective? Uh, is there a democratization opportunity with things like uh, virtual reality and other immersive technologies? Or is that not really uh, 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 the type of thing one should concern oneself with when we're looking at the opportunities with XR and uh, how to um, get better healthcare outcomes for less money? No, I think you're absolutely right, Barry, in that we should always be thinking about inclusivity and accessibility with regards to these emerging technologies. It's, sure. it's an issue that never goes away, no matter what technology or what sort of what audience you're looking at implementing it with. The good news, though, is that I would say XR technology has become far more accessible over the past few years. Well, that's cool. If you yeah. look back um, in 2016, for example, you had to spend at least $1,500 to get a good virtual reality experience because you had to have, you know, the computer system and you had to have yes. there, and yeah. you had to have the peripherals and the sensors. So in, in essence, it was complicated. So it wasn't accessible from a technical perspective, right? But also expensive. So it wasn't accessible from a financial perspective. Sure. The situation we have now is that you have these devices, you know, things like uh, things like these standalone headsets Wow, that's wow, a little bit scary. <laughs> all, all new technology is. Um, but they're effectively dropped down in price to $299 now, which makes it far more accessible for, you know, businesses or users to start considering adopting and using in uh, in everyday life. So we're yeah. getting there, but there is still more work to do to, to get it to wider populations. As it stands, the current penetration rate of the technology is anywhere between about 6 and 16%, depending on which analyst uh, data you're looking at. So okay. almost almost about to hit that 
that point of mainstream adoption, which is which is good. Yeah. Oh, no, that's very interesting. Um, I guess this uh, accessibility issue is incredibly important, and um, I'm always reminding myself of the what do you want to call it of the of the first world problems I have, like with this device, and it's always barking at me every hour to stand up and breathe. Um, and yet, um, I guess we have to remind ourselves that half of the people on Earth do not have good internet connectivity or any connectivity whatsoever. And so there's some big themes here, which I think are very um, interesting and, uh, and, 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 and worth considering. Um, so Jeremy, in terms of these, uh, what you may call slightly exotic technologies with XR, in other words, you know, they're not mass market. Um, it's not like a bicycle or a, a, a smartphone just yet. Um, wh wh where are we going with that? Where are we going to be five years from now? And what can we be doing to drive that successful direction? So I wish I could tell you with certainty that within five years, we will definitely have a significant portion of the population using these devices. Problem is, I've been uh, I've been banging on about it for the last few years and it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> but we, know that, we know that overnight success comes after 20 years of extremely hard work. Exactly, exactly. But the thing is, I, I have done the research on previous technologies. So I wrote a book recently called Reality Check, which tries to help oh, cool. people understand XR in context with other technologies. So there was a particular section that I looked at and it was about us answering the question, how long did it take us to adopt other technologies in our history over the last hundred years? And sure. that has a benchmark for understanding XR technology, and you could even use it to understand other technologies. But what I found is really interesting. Things like the radio took only six years to be adopted in the, in the mainstream world, whereas the internet actually took eight years the landline took 29 years. So if you think about that range and the fact that the first VR headset was sold to consumers um, in 1993, we're still within, we're on the end, end of that range nearly, but still within the range of time it's taken previous technologies to be adopted. So I'm still very, um, I'm very positive about it. I remain positive and I've got some data to back me up at least. Absolutely. Yeah, could I could I jump in there, Barry? Because um, one of the things that I've been quite struck by, and, and Rachel referred to the uptake of video consultations during the, um, during the pandemic and that sort of forced spread and adoption. Yes. I too am writing a book, Jeremy, about um, digital transformation of the NHS through the lens of COVID, and interviewing a lot of clinicians. And one of the things that's really struck me is that actually the telephone seems to be the most used technology. Um, and I'm not even sure we're using text message and the telephone as well as we could be. Um, and whilst video consultations have a, have a, a role to play, um, actually it's often the humble telephone that just serves, is good enough and serves people's needs. I spoke to one um, consultant uh, who was um, running a virtual ward and he said, patients don't want me to see them ill in their beds. They want to do a telephone call because they're embarrassed. They don't want you to see their messy home or whatever it might be. Yes. So I think even with these fairly ubiquitous and, and well-used technologies, often we don't even need those. We can do something much more simple. Hmm. I, um, I, even if you're not a patient in, in the business world, it's the same thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, Sorry, it's funny. Um, it's funny because I think the QR code is another one that, you know, didn't get any traction for donkey's years. And yet, um, you know, in, in, in way of um, something being used extensively in the last 12 months. Uh, I mean, I've, I've certainly not uh, not been a user of them much previously. But of yes. course, when you're checking into venues, not that any of us are at the minute because we're on a national lockdown. Uh, but um, when we were roaming around a little bit before. Uh, and I, I think the interesting bit with digital transformation in healthcare and, and other sectors is, you know, it's easy to go chasing the really sexy cutting edge stuff. But the reality is you go into the doctor's surgery and the screen doesn't bloody work and you don't know when you're being called into the room. And so some of this, you know, needs to be very basic. And, you know, I still spend a lot of time talking to clinicians who say, you know, I log on for 10 minutes every morning. And, you know, it's, I think it's, it just needs to be a, some of the basics need to be absolutely sorted uh, before, uh, before charging off to, uh, you know, solve all the problems. 
we need to run at two tracks, don't we? So we need to sort the basics, but we need to have our eye to the future and be preparing for that. But I guess if we focus too much at the at the art of the possible end, then you start to lose credibility with the clinicians who are struggling with their passwords yeah. and their log on. So it's how you manage to hold both of those things at the same time and don't lose sight of the bigger picture whilst paying attention to the here and now sort of yes. challenges and problems we've got. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Shane, uh, with what you guys are doing, is there any voice technology involved or any reference to the good old uh, POTS, the plain old telephone system, as they say in the industry? Yeah, so um, the potential is there, Barry. You know, in, in truth, if I if I take what everyone has said in the last 10 minutes and, and I, I come back to uh, what, the last piece that Victoria said, actually, which is taking people with you and making best use of what's already available. We don't have a ubiquitous good standard of use of any technology anywhere. Right. And and I, uh, prior to setting up my company, I've just spent 12 years as CEO and, and, and executive chair at, uh, at IMS, where we provide electronic patient records to 200 hospitals for about 12 million people. There's only a tiny, tiny part of uh, the information around a person. And I've experimented with different technologies and I'm a big fan of enabling new things but you, we have to get the standard of things up first. I said that to Matthew Gould that he arrived into our scene in, in HSX, which yeah. is uh, we can all talk about the new shiny stuff, but that yeah. can be a distraction. Now, what I would say, building on the XR capabilities, I, I uh, experimented uh, with a bit more than experimentation with, with 3D technology about eight, nine years ago. Fantastic results in both uh, training and memory uh, retention and uh, yes. our, I've seen more recently examples have been more convey over the last couple of years, a couple of examples where VR capability has been used with patients about their conditions about recovery. And now they're using technologies actually in care homes to be able to communicate back. I think if we bundle telephones, video consultation, data, and, and importantly, speech. So speech, whether it's recorded uh, in text or not, doesn't matter because the technology we've got is we can amalgamate that around the citizen make it safely available to the people that need it. And I'm going across health and social care. So primary care, acute mental health, community, uh, safeguarding, uh, different parts of social care. We, we can amalgamate different types of knowledge around that person. Yes. And I think what's important to do, and I think what it exists in, in uh, today in London is a fantastic example called the Data Discovery Service. And it's probably got about 7 million patients' deep data coming together and it's being used in different areas. Now, it is a bit data-esque, as Victoria said before, but the potential is to capture anything related. So multimedia is where I think we need to be. And that's not just for the, the, the clinicians and people uh, in the back of the ambulance or in an outpatient department or in theatres. It's also so the patient and their carers can have a better understanding of what's going on. Mm. So it, it's a well-known fact. If you are sitting in, a, in front of a consultant being diagnosed with cancer, you will capture around 10% of what's said. And if you are also, you know, not only are you shocked, but by the time you get home, that, will, that knowledge will dissipate further. So it's important to have access to your information and understand its availability. But the real benefit then is using that data, analyzing it with the power of uh, algorithms and artificial intelligence capabilities mm. to predict and prevent. And how we reach the, the other three and a half billion people on the planet who don't have access to, to you know, technologies, actually three and a half billion people on the planet don't have access to good healthcare. So I do think we can take care of now, but we can provide for the future as well. And we just need a 10 year view to start with. We need, and I agree with, with, with what Rachel said, somebody's got to put a stake in the ground and say, okay, this part, there's a 10 year vision, off you go. And let's mm -hmm. see how far we can go and then keep updating that in a, in a continuous way. Yes. I um, ju just jumping in there, uh, in, in way of uh, being able to access data. Um, you know, I, I think some of the work that, um, that we did at NHS Digital in way of serving up the NHS app uh, has kind of come into its own in the, in the last 12 months. But, but again, I think it's a building block. Um, and, you know, the NHS should open up and create an ecosystem around this rather than be, you know, the, um, the cutting edge tech provider. It needs to be a platform. So we need to serve up, um, you know, the ability for open APIs, uh, the ability for consistent standards, um, but let the market build on top of that in a secure way, mindful yes. of, yeah. of patient data.
Rachel, tell us a little bit more about the NHS app. We have a lot of listeners from around the world who might not be familiar with that. So in way of the NHS app, so I led the patient facing transformation of the NHS for a couple of years. And the, the remit there really was about uh, taking which what was a flat file content, so NHS choices, okay. um, and it's a huge, rich uh, set of content, but transforming that to live transactional services. Uh, and we built out services like register with the GP, like booking appointments and accessing your medical record. Um, and that, I mean, I, I left there three years ago and things have continued to develop. Um, and, and certainly the foundation of the COVID-19 app um, again, as 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 grown out from the standards built around the app, but, okay. but it's about you know people taking responsibility and donating their data and that value creation with the NHS. Yes, yeah, okay, no, that's fascinating. Well, with all this data, how do you say it, flying around in zillions of terabytes um, every minute of the day? Um, Jeremy, what are the issues for clinicians, for example, and where do immersive technologies um, fit in here? If a clinician is just overwhelmed with data coming at them from left, right, and center, and up and down, uh, are there applications regarding education or, for example, uh, XR technologies? Yeah, absolutely. If you think about it, uh, immersive technologies can really help with that, that data analysis or visualization exercise to help you understand it in a in an easier more intuitive way what right before that would probably be something along the lines of uh, a machine learning or artificial intelligence algorithm that delivers you a filtered subset of that data from which you can work and start to use the real estate around you the 360 degree space around you yes. to investigate that data to discover new patterns to analyze it in a more natural way than is possible by use it, by, by placing all of that data on a 2D screen and, and asking a clinician to use their keyboard and their mouse as a proxy for their, you know, their natural tools, their hands, their head, their ability to, uh, to, to, to manipulate that environment using those appendages. And that's what you can use immersive technologies for. Yes. Yeah. No, that's um, th th that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I remember quite literally back in 2015 when we held our big uh, international giant health event and there was the um, Microsoft HoloLens uh, on display uh, with a um, uh, Cleveland Clinic Hospital application for basic education of anatomy for medical students. And um, I just remember med students coming up uh, back in 2015 and putting that uh, virtual reality goggles on and looking at the five minute anatomy lesson and saying that it made more sense than the one year of anatomy classes they had had. Uh, so it, I guess it's extremely impactful, isn't it? And uh, I know we don't want to get too excited about the, uh, the shiny new, but can we see that Star Wars helmet again that you pulled up, Jeremy? <laughs> Absolutely. And what, tell us what this is. So this is an Oculus Quest 2 device. It is a virtual reality headset, uh, which is meant for, you know, you can use it as a, as a consumer or as a business. And the idea is it allows you to immerse yourself in a completely different environment, a different world, a different time, a different set of circumstances. And that can be used for all sorts of training when it comes to soft skills or practical skills. So from, an health, from a healthcare perspective, this could be anything from how do you deal with patients? How do you deliver very difficult news all the way through to, and I got to experience this particular example firsthand, how do you perform a certain you know, knee surgery, for example? I didn't get to go through the whole surgical procedure, but I did get to do the initial in injection into the, the muscles around the knee. And wow. it's quite, quite amazing in terms of the immersiveness of the environment. You feel like it's there. Um, it is not making use of, uh, of an actual cadaver. Um, so from a scalability perspective, it's that the training is very available and very easy to, to distribute. Mm. Um, and and uh, sorry to bring another term in, but haptics technology, the ability to touch and feel in a virtual world as well was introduced. So when I press the needle, against the patient's bone, skin, or muscle, I got a different response back, pushback against my, uh, against my hand that matched with what I would expect 
to feel yes. that I did that in the real world. Yes. Yeah, I know that's fascinating. That reminds me of um, our chairman, Shafi Ahmed, doing the surgical lectures to 25,000 Chinese medical students who all had the virtual reality goggles on. And I guess the, um, the point regarding scalability is, is quite profound there. Um, but again, we have all this data. Uh, we have new technologies. Um, uh, does that just create even more challenges for interoperability. Um, Shane, if today uh, the GP is talking to me uh, face to face, um, tomorrow uh, I'm having a video call with her. Uh, next year she puts her virtual reality goggles on to actually see the real me when uh, I'm, I'm speaking to her. That's more data, is that right? That's more interoperability challenges. That's more uh, Facebook saying buy our kit and Samsung saying buy our kit. And uh, how do you guys stitch all that together? So, so the platform's got to be, it's got to be enabled. You know, it's not for us to, to decide what's the right technology. I think mm. the investment in creating the, the, the first thing that, that happened with the data discovery service in London was whilst so, several of us uh, have been involved in trying to move interoperability and interfacing on for nearly three decades, we kind of tried a lot, lot of initiatives where we created the Newcastle Declaration in 2015, 100 companies signed up, 100 NHS organizations signed up, about seven companies were kind of really involved. You know, there's a lot of okay. people behind for various reasons. And then we created Interopen and it's a similar kind of thing. But actually what we said in London was, do you know what, don't worry about the data, don't worry about the standards, give us it, we'll cleanse it as best we can, we'll standardize it in something like SNOMED and then we were able to, we were able to use it. So to me, I likened it to sort of a, a, a the oceans of, uh, the, literally the oceans that we've got now, oceans of data coming from different tributaries, from different rivers. Let us right. talk about creating an environment where we can nurture that data and use it for many things, whether it's for connecting existing platforms yes. and interoperating and providing a, pla providing a place where new platforms can come along. Mm -hmm. So it, the potential is huge. I think if I could really come back to what Victoria was talking about right at the start here, the people is the thing we are i always i've in 25 years of technology i have said we are a people business first and the technology has to work but there's lots of examples of technology so where you talked about um uh, you know how will it look in the future i think what we want to get to is a really good standard of data sharing to start with we're not yes. there yet there's some interesting initiatives uh, about you know nhsx has said give us a shared care record across the country by september that's okay. There are some shared care records that are just the wrong technology for the future. But we start from where we start from and we build out from there. So on top of the platform, we have to provide access to the information in a cleansed way, in a safe way and for multiple use. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the philosophy that I have is to take that capability, one, uh, make it available to everybody to use. And I think we get to a tipping point where 70, 80% of people are now involved then there's some of the companies and some of the biggest, most expensive companies in the world refuse to play in our space of sharing. There will be nowhere left for them to go. They will have to come on board. Yes. Instead of us waiting for them to do it, we'll have just made the platforms happen. And then, you know, we don't know in three or four years time, although I'm talking about a hundred years, I don't know in three or four years time what new technologies will enable. Will VR and AR, will it become something that's actually easy to adopt and use? But actually, we're still struggling. And what I would include in the NHS 10,000 organizations, there are private organizations too. So whether it's dental, whether it's the private sector, you know, we've got a real uh, build up now, especially with COVID, of people to be treated. We had 4.4 million people looking for treatment before COVID. Some people are talking about maybe 10 million people now. We've got mm. reporting issues. Mm. I can just talk about that. If we get really clever, um, there's two or three things here. The single biggest reason people seek out a doctor in the first place or a consultation is actually for reassurance, but they don't know that. They might have a lump, a bump, a, a sore of some kind, a worry of some kind, but 80% of it is okay. We know that. And I, I, when I started in this, in this industry 25 years ago, 80% of results come back, they're okay. But it's okay to ask the question and we must map that. And then as things change, we must map the future and we must look differently. But that comes to resource. We don't have enough nurses. We have a shortfall of 45,000 nurses at the moment, uh, about 10,000 doctors. And there are more people that have come back to the service, but there are more people who we're going to need globally. So we aren't, we aren't treating half the world in a good fashion yet. If we use technology well, we can predict not only and prevent, but we can look where the resource is going to be needed. So this isn't just mm -hmm. about sort of patient data and patient involvement. It has much wider connotations. And the final part of that is this. 
uh, the great Professor Hans Rosling, who I was an enormous fan of, sadly passed away a couple of years ago. Yes. Spent 20 years researching the world, and he looked at uh, literally, you know, conurbations, provinces, cities, and countries as to what they did first. And every single example he came across over a 200 year journey of somewhere that invents, invested in health first became wealthy. They, they, the wealth came. And for too long, I say for 30, 40 years, we've seen our health services as costs. Uh, yeah. to our to our society and they're not they're places of investment that's and a I, very good point we, we don't invest as much in healthcare technology as we do in banking as uh, as uh, air air technology or space technology we need the fractions to go up the percentages to go up of investment and the thing i would say the opportunity for this generation for this country um is to appeal to people in health now where there's a chance to actually get money that's quite cheap to invest now more than ever and mm -hmm. we will Bought that that investment, uh, we will we will take that around the world. I'm absolutely no doubt. And can yeah. I can I just support that quickly as well, Barry? Uh, we did an analysis in in PwC about the impact of of XR technologies, and what we found is that healthcare, even just from an economic impact perspective, the numbers do stack up in terms of how how much it's going to contribute. To the global economy by 2030 so we, yes. we expect it should contribute about 360 billion dollars to global gdp by 2030 so it's not only um it's not only a, a sort of uh, there are figures to back it up basically um as well as uh, the the obvious benefits from a health perspective to a society hmm, hmm. no that's extremely worthwhile and uh, thank you uh, shane and um, thank you, Jeremy, for sharing that. Um, uh, we'll want to put links to that report that you make reference to, Jeremy, the PwC report in um, uh, in this TV show. And likewise, Shane, if you don't mind, we'd love to reference that author and that book that you made uh, reference to. So um, don't let us forget that, please. Well, look, you guys, this has been extremely, extremely interesting. And uh, we're running out of time. I wish we were all together in the pub right now because I'd like to buy another round. And uh, I'd be uh, the happiest person uh, on this island if we could continue the conversation for another hour together. So uh, to begin with, I want to thank you. But also, let's just go around the room very briefly. And if you can give us a little tiny snippet of uh, any particular vision of the future that you have or any requests that you want to make to our international audience, regarding what you guys are doing, what you're looking for, who you're looking to engage with, what you have for sale. Uh, maybe you get a commission, Jeremy, from those helmets that you're selling. <laughs> I don't appreciate it yet, I'll get there. <laughs> no, joking aside, uh, we, we wanna hear about what you guys have in mind for the, the, the healthy future we're all aiming for and whether or not our community can help you. So any uh, uh, idea here about uh, your, your vision, where we wanna be, or, or any request or ask that you have to our audience. So if that's okay, we'll just go around the room. So um, please, Shane, if you want to begin with anything. Thank you. So I set up Temple Black to, to try and crack this problem of uh, bringing data together of all kinds, as I've said in examples of the conversation. I've created a model whereby we can take that globally. Uh, we can deploy it in any country. Mm -hmm. um, we can set up a business model with uh, in the local, uh, local country. And we can deliver on eight of the United Nations 17 sustainability and development goals by creating mm -hmm. better equality and better environments um, we do that at a cost per citizen per annum um, in the uk that cost would be less than the price of a cup of coffee uh, per annum for the average size of family that's how efficient we can deliver this mm -hmm. but um, we are looking for investment partners as well and we are looking at business partners in different parts of the world so far we have uh, business partners who are responsible for about a billion people on the planet so over the next four years, we want to try and get our products to serve a billion people on the planet. And over the next seven to 10 years, we would like that to be across uh, accessible anywhere. But we are looking for impact investors who understand not necessarily a financial return on investment, but a, a return on their impact of the investment that will impact globally. So anybody who's interested in talking to me about that, I'm Shane Tickell. I'm the CEO and founder of Temple, and, and I'd really love to hear from them. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Shane. And it's Temple Black. What's the URL? Uh, it's templeblack.co.uk. Brilliant. Okay. No, good stuff. Thank you for that. And um, Rachel, please. Uh, so just following on from, from, from Shane's uh, previous, uh, previous point, actually, the, uh, one, one of the key, key bits that we've been working on for the last two and a half years is we've been working with the NHS to redesign uh, NHS jobs. So in way of the platform for all of the hiring into the NHS, 
-hmm. So at the minute, we have probably 25% of uh, trusts and GP surgeries uh, using the platform. Nice. Uh, but in way of um, in way of traction, that will increase during the course of this year. And 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 the area that we really work well um, is with the arms length bodies. Um, so we've spent probably three three and a half years building out services uh, for uh, health ALBs, uh, and they tend to go through a kind of discovery alpha beta. Um, and, and I think the reason that we're so good working with ALBs is that's where we've come from. So it's mm -hmm. within that industry that, you know, my personal experience, but also across the uh, across the organization. Uh, and in way of appetite, we're certainly exploring doing something um, in GCC uh, from a kind of UAE perspective. Mm -hmm. So I think that there is, um, you know, the the. The NHS brand is powerful in way of the, the journey and the story. Uh, and we're starting to explore, is there, uh, some of the work that we've done around Empower the Person, so the patient-facing services that have been built out on open source software that yes. we can, you know, we can almost lift and, uh, lift and shift. Um, so I'm Rachel, CEO of Different. Uh, pleasure to be here today. Excellent. Rachel, thank you very much. And we'd love to have you on the show and uh, very keen to develop further collaborations with you. And um, Victoria, hello. Any final hello, hi. You want to share with yeah, us? Yeah. Um, so I suppose the theme that's sort of run throughout this conversation is it's all about people. And we haven't really talked about user centered design and user focused design, but at Mindwave, um, we bring together um, sort of creative industries background, really strong approach to user centered design understanding mm -hmm. the problems and goals that people are trying to achieve and how you help them achieve them with that knowledge of healthcare. Um, so I guess I just want to finish by making the case for user-centred design. Bob Waxer, when he wrote The Digital Doctor all those years ago, five or six years ago, said that IT is the master of all adaptive challenges and that is absolutely the case. We mm -hmm. need to put people at the centre of design we need to understand their goals and the problems they're trying to solve. And we love working with our NHS clients and charities and startups that have a similar approach. So, yeah. Perfect. Excellent. And um, what's the website that we'd like to direct our audience to, please, Victoria? Um, it's uh, mindwave.org. Um, Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank and, you. Um, Jeremy, last but not least. I wrote Reality Check to try and break down some of the myths surrounding XR technology. Mm. And one of them is that it is a very isolating technology. And a lot of people have quite a few dystopian visions of, uh, of the future usage, right. of, uh, especially virtual reality, let's say. Sure. So I would love nothing more with my, uh, my uh, unrelenting optimism to see a world where the technology is used for good to enhance and enrich people's lives and to help them from a health perspective, to help them le live healthier lives where we're more connected than we potentially are you know, at the moment. Yes. So, um, I envisage a future where similar to how we have technology there to help us, such as a, a laptop, a tablet, a mobile phone, we may also have with us a virtual reality headset which sits alongside us when we need it for those times where it's most useful. Hmm. And, uh, so that's what I'm excited about. Brilliant. Jeremy, thank you very much. And uh, what's the name of your book and how do we find that, please? The book is called Reality Check and you can find more details about it at realitycheckxr.com. Perfect. Oh, well, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, that sounds extremely interesting and relevant for our discussion and for the future of healthcare. So um, on behalf of all of our audience, uh, obviously uh, Shane and Rachel and Victoria and Jeremy, thank you so much. Um, really loved our conversation. And uh, I'm really glad that we had the chance to hear your views and uh, we're quite keen to keep in touch with you all. So hope to welcome you back to one of our Healthy Innovators live TV shows sometime in the future. So thank you once again. And uh, on behalf of our sponsors, I'd like to thank Vodafone Business and Barclays Bank Eagle Labs. And of course, these shows are produced by Giant Health. Giant is an international community of nearly 200,000 people around the world. Everybody whose business is healthcare innovation. We're having a number of new events coming up this year. In particular, we'd like to emphasize European Health Tech Innovation Week, which is coming up from the 17th to the 21st of May. You can learn about that at www.giant.health. We're having five events in Barcelona, Berlin, Stockholm, Paris, and Liverpool. 
and we'd love to welcome all of our listeners to come to those events. The events are hybrid, so you can fly to any of these cities and join us in our conferences and our trade shows, or you can participate entirely remotely uh, via our virtual event technology platform. So we'd really love to have everybody participating, whether you are a clinician, an investor, a technology provider, whether you are working directly in healthcare or you're involved in associated professions, we welcome everybody who has a passionate interest in uh, supporting our vision, which is to improve the health and the well being of people around the world by facilitating innovation and supporting health tech entrepreneurs. So, once again, my name is Barry Schreier. Thanks to Rachel, thanks to Victoria, thanks to Shane, and thanks to Jeremy. Love having you guys on board. And uh, thank you once again, everybody who's been listening to this episode. This has been Healthy Innovators Live TV. Thank you very much.